All right, now the point of the scripture here in Luke chapter 6 that I want to focus on starts off in verse number 27. This is a sermon that's going to hopefully reach your heart. We need to make a heart change today in order to live more like Christ and to be able to fulfill what He is telling us to fulfill in this scripture. Look at verse 27. He says, But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you and unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek offer also the other and him that taketh away thy cloak forbid not to take thy coat also. The, the title of my sermon is Turning the Other Cheek. We need to learn to have this type of an attitude, this type of a mentality, because honestly, this is not your initial reaction when someone does you wrong. When someone hits you in the face, your, your initial response is not, okay, go ahead and turn, hit the other one also. But this is what Jesus is teaching here. And this is something that we have to focus on changing in our life. Because your natural response is going to be, hey, oh, you're going to attack me, I'm going to attack you back. Right? That is our number one natural response as a human being in our flesh. That's what we want to do. But Jesus is teaching the opposite. And here's why. Now look at this. It says, verse 27, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Right? So there are people that you have in this lifetime that are going to be your enemies for whatever reason. Oftentimes it doesn't even have anything to do with, with church necessarily or religious beliefs. For some reason, people just, there's people in this world that, that want to be your enemy because they don't like you for whatever reason that may be. They don't like the way they look, that you look. They don't like the way you talk. They don't like where you're from. Whatever. Right? There's people are your enemies. But God doesn't, God's telling us here that the attitude that we ought to not, not have is not one of, oh, well, you're my enemy. Well, then I'm going to be, you know, the same or more back to you, right back at you, buddy. That's the wrong attitude to have. He says to love your enemies. He says, do good to them which hate you. Someone hates you. Someone, you know, he says, do good unto them. This is how we need to carry. There's a, there's a standard that God is giving for us that is much higher than the standard of the world. Okay, God is saying you need to lift yourself up above that. Not lifting yourself up in pride, but lifting yourself. It's actually the, the exact opposite. You're morally lifting yourself up over people who want to curse you and hate you and just say bad things about you because we are called as Christians to be ministers and to be servants and to esteem others better than ourselves. Now, I know I've been preaching about this kind of a lot lately, but it is a very important subject and it is a major theme of the Bible. And it's something that, that takes time and I think we need to hear over and over again. And I'm not saying I think we have a specific problem with this in our church. I don't think that. But... It takes time to make changes in your life and in your heart um, to be able to, to have the right mindset and to be serving Christ as a servant and to have humility and to have meekness. And especially as men, you know, men have a, have a lot more tendency to have a problem with pride than women do. It's, it, it can often be harder for a man to humble himself, you know, when you have a guy issuing a challenge to you. Right? Someone that wants to fight or that, want, you know, that, that hates you and, and, and they're, they're calling you names or whatever. Men have a, have a tendency a lot more so than women. Women have the same problem too, but, but men have a tendency to, to be able to say, oh, okay, you want to fight, I'm ready to fight. Now, what I'm not saying today, and, and this is really important too with understanding what Jesus is teaching here. We do need to fight and we do need to turn the other cheek. The question is, when do we fight and when do we turn the other cheek? The fight that we have is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual fight. So am I going to fight for the Word of God? Absolutely. If, if someone's going to attack me for what I believe, am I going to change what I believe? Am I going to shut up my voice and not preach Jesus Christ? No. In that regard... I am going to continue to fight. I'm going to arm myself. I'm going to have the Word of God, and I'm going to go out and fight. But that is not a physical fight. Look at what he's saying here, what we're dealing with. It's, it's the physical realm. When someone hates you and they become your enemy, hey, love that person, right? Because people that do that are typically going to be, typically are going to be someone that's lost, 
someone who doesn't know Christ, someone who doesn't know Jesus, they hate you for whatever, they hate you for your beliefs, they hate you for something else. Hey, for one, you know, we, we read earlier in this chapter, God's saying, look, rejoice and be glad. When people persecute you, when, when, when trouble comes your way because of your beliefs, because you're standing on the Bible, be happy. Don't let it get you down. Don't let it upset you. Don't, you know, rejoice over that. Hey, that's great. That means you're doing the right thing. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. And again, the initial reaction in our flesh, in our body, is not one of rejoicing. It's one of, oh man, you know, if you're anything like me, you don't want people upset with you in general. I mean, just, you know, you talk to people, you want them to like you, you talk to them, you're friendly with them. You know, I don't want people hating me. I'm not out looking for enemies. It's nice to have people be able to have a, a, a normal conversation with and, and can respect each other and not having people just constantly berating you and tell you how, how horrible you are and how stupid you are and how bigoted you are and how everything else. I mean, no one likes to receive that. But the Bible's saying, hey, rejoice. Don't let that get you down in the exact opposite. Be happy about it. The same way when, when you have these enemies that want to do you harm, hey, love them. Do good unto that person. And here's one of the reasons for doing that is because if they're not saved and you are doing the exact opposite of what anyone would expect you to do, that can make someone stop and think, well, whoa, wait a minute. You know, people that, especially people that like to get in fights, they kind of get to understand what the normal response is going to be from people. Now, what I'm not saying as well, I'm not saying to be a coward. There's a difference with that too. There's a difference between, because here's, look at what he says in verse 29. He says, unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. He doesn't say go running away and hiding and scared and, and don't, you know, don't ever look that person in the eye again. You still could stand your ground, but he says, okay, oh, you're going you're gonna to be physical. Okay, I'm not going to get physical. Go ahead. You want, you, you're mad at me. You hate me. You want to you wanna punch me in the face? Go ahead. Punch the other side also. That still, that takes a lot of guts. That takes a lot of courage to be able to stand your ground like that. It doesn't mean you have to back down on what you believe. It doesn't mean you have to back down on what you, you, know, on what you teach or what you say. But our battle is not a physical one. So he's saying to turn the other cheek. He's saying, oh, go ahead, off the other. Oh, you're going to take away my cloak? Yeah, go ahead, take it all. I don't care about this stinking money. I don't care about your pride. I don't care about my pride. You know, whatever. That's not what I'm all about. And when you can have that type of an attitude where you can look at someone that can do you wrong and still love that person, now you're getting a lot closer to who Jesus is and what he is all about. Because who are you but a sinner that has broken God's laws, broken God's commandments? God could look at you and say, you've done me wrong over and over and over and over again. How many times have you done me wrong? And in righteousness, God can say, depart from me into hell. But the love that he had, even though while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we continue to sin, God still loves us and does things for us that we don't deserve. When we can take that mentality and, and, and understand that, when we turn it in on ourselves, that will help you to turn it back outward again. When you start thinking, okay, here's someone that's attacking me and I don't like it and I want to go attack them. Well, what happens when you have, in a sense, attacked Jesus yourself? by disobeying him, by you know, disrespecting him. How did he deal with you? And um, you know, he loved you. He loved you enough to die for you and still to do things for you and minister unto you. And this is the type of attitude that we ought to have. Let's read through this again. I know we read it when we, when we started, um, before, we, before I started preaching, but let's go through this. He says in verse 27, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. I mean, you're taking the time to pray for somebody that's despite, that despite, despitefully using you means they have disdain for you, they don't care about you at all, and they are just using you. Now, when someone is, and this isn't just some random person who's not doing you any harm, this is someone who's trying to do harm to you. Stop that. Someone who's trying to do harm unto you 
You are actually taking the time out of your day to say, I'm going to pray for that person. That is an incredible love to have. But that is the type of love that we are called to have, that Jesus is commanding us to have if we're going to be like him because that's the type of love that he had. We need to get over ourselves and get focused on others. That is what this life is about. Being focused on others. The world will tell you it's all about me, 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 me. Do the best that you can. You know, make the most money that you can. Get the most toys that you can. Get the biggest house that you can. Get the most cars that you can. Whereas the attitude of God and Christ is you, 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 you. I'm going to help you. What can I do to help you out? I'm not worried about myself. Hey, if that means that I have to, to, to give up some, some financial blessings or whatever it is I have to help you out, that's what I'm going to do. You want to take my coat? Oh, you want, you, want to, you want to sue me and take my jacket? Go ahead. Take it all. Go ahead. Doesn't mean, it means nothing to me. Go ahead and do it. Oh, you want to hit me in the face? Go ahead. Hit me again. Verse 29, and unto him that smite thee on the one cheek, offer the other also. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. This is often, you know, people love this verse. It's a great verse. You know, do unto others as you, you know, it's called the golden rule. Basically, it's a, it's a way of thinking that if you want, you know, however you would want to be treated. Let's say you did someone wrong, right? You got angry at someone and you did them wrong. How would you want them to deal with that, with, to deal with you? You're completely in the wrong. You get angry and you do something to them. Wouldn't you really appreciate it if they showed forgiveness and kindness and were able to overlook what you did wrong? This is what we need to be constantly thinking about when someone does us personally wrong. When someone does you wrong, you say, okay, you know, if I were to do the same thing, and, and you can't be thinking, well, I would never do that to somebody. You know, so they deserve this. They deserve vengeance. They, I, I'm going to take, I'm going to get that back to them. No. If, if I were to do that, how would I want to be treated? And that's a good guideline to use. It says in verse 32, For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. He's saying, look, if all you're going to do is do nice things for people who do nice things for you, he's like, you're no different than the world. Everybody does that. That's how everybody responds. If someone does some, oh, oh, I really like this person. They do a lot of nice things for me. I'm going to do something nice for them. Hey, there's nothing wrong for doing that, but that isn't anything special. There is nothing remarkable about doing that because that's what everybody does. Verse 33, And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. The world does that. The sinners do that. Verse 34, And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So he's saying here, look, and, and even in lending, and this is a good, this is a good um, attitude to have as well. If you decide you're going to lend something out to someone in church, don't expect to get it back again. That's what we just read that here. He says, verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. So when you give something out, just expect that you're never going to get it again because you don't want to have some envy, or not envy, but some bitterness and some strife against a fellow brother or sister in Christ. You lend that out because all that's going to do then is, oh, this person, they broke it, they did this, they did that. You know, and, and then you're going to start having contention and strife and, and ill feelings towards each other. You should be able to just say, okay, you know what? They, bro they, they broke this or they didn't return it. I forgive them. If I would have done that to them, I really would appreciate it if they would just forgive me. That's the attitude that we ought to have. Now, you're not, you don't always have to lend things to people, but if you do, that's the attitude you should have. But Jesus is telling us, you know, look, if, if someone doesn't have something, lend to them, give to them. You know, if someone's in need, give it to them. If we have something that you need, I'm going to give it to you. 
Because these things don't matter. And we ought not to let these things come in the way of a relationship with a brother or sister in Christ, especially. But even those that aren't, I mean, even those that aren't saved, you give something to someone, kiss it goodbye. If you get it back again, hey, great. Bonus. Right? But if you don't, whatever. You don't need that to, you don't need to have that type of uh, um, bitterness in your heart. He says, and, and I like this too. He says, and your reward shall be great. Remember, Brother Sebastian, we were talking today out soul winning about rewards. Yeah. Well, here's a great example of a way that you can earn rewards that's not just winning souls to Christ. I think that's the primary one. But we see right here, he's saying, look, if you love your enemies, if you're doing good, if you're lending out, if you're not stingy with your stuff, and you're giving to people that have need, and you're helping people out in, in various ways, he says, hey, great is your reward in heaven. That's a great testimony. That's great love to show unto other people. Um, God's going to see that. God will see you being selfless. God will see that and he say, hey, you know what? I like that. I'm going to reward him for that. I'm going to reward him for being able to just give whatever. You know, he was saving this money up. For what, you know, and it doesn't have to all be about money, but it, you know, whatever. He was saving this up to do something nice for himself. This person came up with a need. Here you go putting other people first. And, and, you know, it could be anything. But you could earn rewards that way. And he says, And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Saying God is kind unto those that are unthankful and to the evil that do harm unto others. God is kind to them. You know, there are people that get saved that put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. God is merciful and kind to those people, even if they turn out to be unthankful for that gift that they've received. The Bible does not say you have to be thankful for God giving you that gift of salvation. Now, you should if you, if you want to do what's right in His eyes, if you want to be a blessing and a good child, yeah, of course. But He says here, you know, hey, God's kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And this gets into, you know, the whole judge not thing is found in Matthew chapter 7 as well. Um, but we see there where he's saying, look, the, the same way that you treat people, the same way that you are, it's going to come back to you again. That's the way that God is going to um, judge you. When, if you are very forgiving, if you, if you are very long-suffering, if you're very merciful to people, if people are constantly doing you wrong and you are always overlooking transgressions and you're always very forgiving, hey, God will treat you the same way. That in itself is like, I mean, talk about a great insurance policy, right? If you were to screw up or do something bad, if you are just always merciful and, and forgiving and having that type of an attitude towards people, you could at least know, hey, God, you know, I know I've done wrong. Please extend mercy unto me. And you could say that in a good conscience if that's the way that you treat other people. Because God says, hey, the way that you deal with that, I'm going to do the same to you. So if you come down real hard on someone who's, you know, who's uh, done you wrong, well, wait until you do something wrong. God's going to come back down hard on you as well. Um, you know, people have a tendency, and I think this isn't preached very often on turning the other cheek. I don't know why. Maybe it's because people don't quite understand. They think it's like, they think it's like, a, like you have to back down or you're showing weakness or something. But as I mentioned earlier, I think it's the exact opposite. I think it takes a lot of courage to be able to stand and to restrain yourself and to be temperate in all things, to be able to control your emotions, to be able to control your physical actions, to be able to stand in the face of adversity and of your enemy and be able to say, I don't care what you're going to do to me. Go ahead and do it. I'm not going to make this a physical fight because it's a spiritual battle, but I'm not going to back down. I am going to resist the devil. The Bible says resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Now, if you do have a problem with letting things go, right, and if you're not able to always achieve that, because this is what we're talking about here, 
And pride is the number one thing that's going to get in your way from being able to have this type of an attitude. If this is something that you struggle with, if this is something that, that you're always having to make sure that, you know what, this person did me wrong, I need to make sure that they get repaid again. I need to make sure that this comes back down upon them. It's a, it, it's, it's a result of your pride, but you need, in order to fix that attitude, you need to spend more time with Jesus. What do I mean by that? More time in the Bible, in the gospel specifically. Look at the things that Jesus has done for people. Look at the, the attributes that God has with his forgiveness, with his long suffering, and meditate and think for a minute on all of your sins. We have a tendency to think when, when you want to pay someone back for something they've done to you, that's usually as a result of you thinking, I'm such a great person and I am so good and I do this and I don't deserve anything bad coming back to me because I'm so good. Take a step back and think about your personal sins, your private sins, sins that no one else knows about but you and God. Think about those things for a while because that might help bring you down a notch and help you to start to understand, you know what? Yeah, and, and read some of the judgment. Read Revelation. Read Revelation 21, the list that we like to quote over and over again at the door going soul winning. Don't just use that as a verse towards you. Bring that back on yourself. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, sorcerers, whoremongers, and all liars you know, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is a second that that's what you deserve. Me. I deserve that. It's not just for the other person. It's for yourself as well. And if you have this type of a problem, you have to remember that God owes you something. You deserve a punishment. So when you have a problem with someone else thinking, oh man, but they really need to pay for this. No. Let God deal with those things. God dealt with your stuff. If you, especially if you got saved, hey, he's going to deal with that. He's dealt with that. Christ has already dealt with that. We don't need to be the, the, the revenger. King David, I think this is probably one of the best examples of living out this attitude of being able to turn the other cheek. You think about King David with Saul, right? Saul headed out for David. Saul was David's enemy. Now, how did David treat Saul? Did, did David say, oh man, Saul's trying to kill me, so I'm going to go out and make sure I kill him first. Saul's after me, well, I'm going to make sure I get all these people against Saul. I'm going to make sure that he reaps what he sows. Was that David's attitude? Not at all. What did he, he was afraid. He had multiple instances where he could have easily what, taken Saul out. He could have easily killed him two times and he didn't do it at all. David said, you know what? I'm not going to lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. Hey, God will protect me and God will take care of Saul. I'll let him deal with it. God can deal with all these wrongs that, that Saul's doing against me. Lord, judge between me and him. I'm going to let you take care of it. That was David's attitude and that's the attitude that we need to have as well. We need to be able to say, you know what? When someone does me wrong, I'm going to do what's good unto them. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to love them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to pray for them. And God can just deal with it. I'll let God be the judge because he's going to know what's right for them to receive. And actually, whatever you do, you could be, you know, in a, in a way, you could be screwing up what someone really ought to get as a punishment because you're taking it on yourself, right? God's got the perfect way of dealing with people. We don't. David did not need to get revenge for himself. We're going to turn to Psalm 18 and then Psalm 94. We're going to look at some verses, some scripture about vengeance. Because we don't need to be revenging ourselves. This attitude of turning the other cheek is all about vengeance. If you can't... If you can't um, <clears throat> Turn the other cheek. The reason why is because you think you need to get revenge for something that you've done. Psalm 18, let's look at verse number 46. Psalm 18, 46, the Bible reads, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He deliver, delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. So when there's a violent man here, we see at the end of this verse, that wants to hurt you and wants to come at you and, and do you harm and 
do violence unto you? Psalm 18 saying, God has delivered me from that person. The tr your trust is in God. He's saying, you've lifted me up against those that rise up against me. God delivers me. God is the avenger, and he's the one that's going to subdue people. And you turn, if you would, to Psalm 94. You're in Psalm 18. Just flip over to Psalm 94. We're start reading in verse number one of Psalm 94. The Bible reads, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. So here we see a prayer. This is praying to God, saying, look, God, vengeance belongs unto you. He, he says it twice. God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. He's saying, you know, you are responsible for doing vengeance and for bringing vengeance upon people, and I'm recognizing that, but God, take care of this. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that prayer of saying, you know what, God, this person keeps doing me wrong. I'm trying to do what's right. You're the one who's in charge of, of taking vengeance, Lord, so please just take care of this for me. Because, you know, this person is, you know, they're, they, won't, they won't let up. He says in verse 2, Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked... How long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand ye brutish among the people and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall, he not, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers, or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. Now we read this whole song, we're, we're looking at this, you know, and these people, these wicked people, are, are triumphing over God's people in Psalm 94. And we see here, he's saying, look, how long, God, is this going to happen? You know, they're slaying the widow, they're slaying the fathers, and they're saying, you know, God can't see what I'm doing. They think they're getting away with all of this stuff. That's the attitude that they have. But he's saying how ridiculous that, look, he that formed me, he's not going to know. You know, God's the one that, that made you. How is he not going to know what's going on? And he says, um, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. And, um, you know, oftentimes it can get difficult when you see how the wicked people continue to go without vengeance being brought upon them. You might start to, to, to doubt or, or to just get irritated or upset because you say, man, these people just, I mean, like these abortion doctors. They're killing babies on a daily basis. I mean, they're just killing and killing and killing. How is it, God? How is it that they are just not brought low? And they're, they're rich. They've got all this money. They've got all this wealth. And they just keep on doing this day after day. And it's wicked and abominable. And they keep on killing the fatherless. They keep on slaying these people. How can that be, Lord? But God will avenge all of that blood. And see, we don't need to worry. We don't need to take that physical battle into our own hands and go and kill the abortion doctors because they're doing this, this abomination. God will deal with them. And it is wickedness. Now, does that mean we don't say anything about it and we just hide and just, and just forget about it and put it out of our mind? No. We shout against it. We fight the spiritual battle. We will, will stand up and, and you know, make noise and protest and do whatever it is that we would do. But we're not going to bring the violence because that is not what we're called to do. In all, in, in all these cases, you know, when we turn the other cheek, that's the physical fight, but not the spiritual fight. We are called to be soldiers for Christ. That's a battle. That's a fight. We are to contend for the faith. 
Again, the, the spiritual battle is not one that's physical. And we don't need to worry about when people physically come after us or when people hate us. Hey, we don't need to take vengeance. God is the God of vengeance. Vengeance belongs unto the Lord. He's the one that's going to repay. He's going to one be the one that makes sure that everything happens the way it ought to happen and that people get what's coming to them. We don't need to worry about that. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read from you from Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, 3 says, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. So when the people, when the attacks come, because like I said, it's not always easy to stand and to resist during these times of attacks when the enemy is coming against you. Isaiah 35 is saying, look, if you have a fearful heart, be strong in God because God will come with vengeance. It will happen. He is a just God and a just judge. He is not going to just let this stuff go. He will revenge for you, especially if you don't take it into your own hands. God will come with recompense and he will come and save you. God knows how to deliver the just out of temptation in a time of trouble. You're in Matthew chapter 5. Now this attitude of turning the other cheek requires humility. It requires faith. Faith in the Lord. Faith that God is going to come and, and, and recompense the people who are doing you wrong. You know, you don't see it necessarily, but you just understand and know that God will take care of it. It takes patience. You need to be able to patiently endure when these things come your way. And it takes meekness. You need to swallow your pride and be able to take it and be able to pray for other people that are using you and attacking you. All of the attributes Jesus was teaching about, these are all the things that you need. Jesus was just teaching about these things. You're in Matthew 5. This is kind of the parallel passage to what we read in Luke 6 when we started reading. Um, these both are, are, are parallels. And these attributes that we need in order to deal with this, in order to be able to turn the other cheek, he had brought those up previously. I like the way they're laid out in Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at what it says in verse number 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So these are blessings coming on people, right? Things that, that we wouldn't think of as being pleasurable or, or, or desirable, things you want. Poor in spirit, you know, if you're mourning, you're sad, he says, hey, look, you're blessed. Don't worry about it. Wait. Wait for it because it will come. He says, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're meek, you're humble. That's a great blessing. Be meek, be humble. Now you're going to inherit the earth. Verse number six. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. As I mentioned that earlier. When you are being merciful to others, hey, God will be merciful to you. You are going to obtain mercy. Verse number eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Having the right attitude is, all, is, is completely important. Turn to, turn to Romans 12. It's the last place we're going to turn. It's a shorter sermon tonight. Romans chapter 12. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. We're going to start reading at verse number 9. The Bible says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Again, see, we see that humble attitude. Brotherly love. You love other people in church as, as a brother, as a sister. We're looking out for each other as a family. And we're preferring one another. It says, In honor, you prefer them. I want to help this person out. It says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. There's that patience that we need in times of trouble when, when things are being, um, when you're being attacked. Continuing instant in prayer, 
distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Look what it says next. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. When people are persecuting you, don't curse them. Don't curse them to God. Hey, look, you're being persecuted. I'm going to bless them. Again, contrary to what your initial response should be, but we need to train ourselves into getting into the right response. You can train yourself to, to have a response of blessing people when they curse you. And that's what we need to do, but it takes work. It takes effort. We need to acknowledge, first of all, that this is definitely what God wants us to do. Jesus Christ is commanding us to have this type of a humble attitude, this type of a meek attitude, where we will actually bless people that are persecuting us. Verse number 15, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. So he's saying, be careful of your own, of your own thoughts and your own pride, lifting yourself up. Mind not high things. Don't worry about it. Don't give it mind. Don't think about those things. It says, but condescend, which means bring yourself down low to men of low estate. Verse number 17, recompense, recompense to no man evil for evil. Someone does you wrong, saying, don't do the same back to them. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We are not to be getting into these physical fights and altercations and having problems and strifes and, and, and contentions with just people around us in general. We need to, to live peaceably with people. Again, does that mean you have to back down on what you believe? No, absolutely not. But you try to live as peaceably as you can. If someone's going to have it out for you, you still try to live peaceably with them. You don't instigate it. You don't go back at them. You don't continue a fight. Because here's the thing. You, know, you, you hear about these family feuds, right? Where people have always, just, just for generations, you know, the, the Smiths and the Thomases, they never get along with each other, always fighting. And it just continues on. And it's just like the gang wars too, you know. That there's never anything is solved because... One person gets killed, and they're like, well, we need to go avenge this guy. And then they go and kill two of their guys. They say, well, now we got to go kill them because they killed two of our guys. You know, and just this thing that goes back and forth and back and forth. And it never ends. And it's just a cycle of destruction and death and misery and hate and, and just, just nothing good comes of it. That's why you need to be the bigger person. You need to be able to stop in the tracks and say, okay, I'm not going to continue this cycle. You want to do bad to me? Fine. Go ahead and do it. I'm not going to make sure that I'm avenged and that I, and I treat you back and recompense the evil for the evil that you've done unto me. I'm going to let God deal with that. Look at verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Put wrath away. You get angry, put it away. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore... So because of this, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. So if your enemy has, has something in need, you, you take care of that enemy. You feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Look at this. Look, look, I, I love this verse. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. By you having that right godly, righteous attitude of being able to, to love someone who hates you and being able to take someone who's like with David and Saul. Saul's going out to try to kill David. It'd be like David just coming right back and be like, oh, you're thirsty? Here's something to drink. Oh, here's some food. Right? But he says in, in doing that, you're going to heap coals of fire on their head. Because God, God sees that even more. Think about how much worse it is for a person to do wrong to someone and they have zero reason to do wrong unto them and actually that person is only doing good unto them. The more you do good unto them, like the more wrong it is for them to hate you and to persecute you and to do evil against you. It's, it's that much more egregious for them to do that to you. And God sees that and he's like, he will repay. So the, the, the better you can be to them, for one, I mean, hopefully you can just change their attitude. And you can, you can stop that, that, those attacks or whatever is coming against you because they'll say, wow, 
this person's doing something different. I didn't expect that at all. And then maybe they can humble themselves even to the point, I mean, some people will apologize and say, you know what, I'm sorry. Because they'll feel bad that they're doing something when you've just been doing good to them. And they can recognize that and see that. But if they don't have that type of a repentant heart and, and be able to, to change and recognize, then, they, then God will deal with them with even more coals of fire heaped on their head. And he'll deal with it. And we know that God is a just judge. We don't need to worry about it. That's why we can just say, you know what, I'm going to bless them. I'm going to do good unto him. Verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is how we could end that evil. We overcome that evil. Hey, someone's bringing evil against you. They want to hurt you. We're going to overcome that by doing good. Because as I mentioned before, you just keep on bringing evil, fight evil with evil, it's just more evil gets produced. And it's just going to be that, that continual cycle. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Back and forth. You say, you know what? Go ahead and hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hit you back. Go ahead. I'm going to resist you. I'm not going to back down on what I believe. I'm not going to do you wrong. In fact, you know, I'm going to go home and pray for you. I'm going to pray for you tonight. I'm going to do good unto you. Oh, you have a need? I see. Okay, I'll go help you. It's the attitude that we ought to have. That's the attitude that Christ had for us. Because we've wronged him in many, many, many ways. And he wants us to have that same type of an attitude. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy, for your long-suffering, for your patience with us, dear God. We thank you tremendously for our salvation, dear Lord, for, for purchasing that gift for us, for paying the punishment for us, dear God, that we deserve. We're the ones that have done wrong to you. We don't deserve any of, of your grace and, and eternal life, dear Lord, but you still have loved us and have offered it to us for free. God, what an amazing gift. What an amazing thing to do. Help us to have, to reflect that type of love. Help us to be able to change our attitudes and our minds and to mortify the deeds of our flesh, dear Lord, that want to exact revenge on every person that does us wrong. Help us to be able to, to, in meekness and humility, be able to suffer the wrong that is done unto us the same way that Jesus Christ was able to suffer the violence done against him as he offered himself up lovingly as a sacrifice for us. Please work in our hearts. Help us to change. Help us to be able to, to exhibit this type of behavior, dear Lord. And in so doing, Lord, help us to be able to convert more souls because we are a good testimony unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.